there are two main types of Marxism. There's instrumental Marxism and structural Marxism. So instrumental Marxists, um, these people basically believe wholeheartedly in Marxist thought. They take this instrumental view of, of state control. So the criminal law and the criminal justice system um, are basically instruments to control the poor, have not members of society. And um, so the instrumental Marxists are basically that full-fledged, um, everything is, you know, we can explain crime and things like that because of the way that the criminal justice system uses the state power to control the underclass. So that's sort of your full-fledged, wholehearted Marxists. But then you have your structural Marxists that basically kind of take elements of it, but say, well, it's not quite as like all um, encompassing as Marx originally thought. So structural Marxists say that they, they still think that the structure serves the best interests of the capitalist system um, in the longer term. They feel that it isn't quite that simple, though. Uh, and so the state structure works kind of in a more balanced manner where the law is used to maintain the uh, the long term interests of capitalism and keep capitalism efficient. And so this means that it's not about the interests of the upper class. It's about the interests of the capitalist system itself. And so typically that means then giving more power to the people that have more power um, and sort of that. And so it would work the same way. But it does mean that anybody who poses a threat to the system will still be controlled um, by the law. So the law is going to control anybody of any class who threatens its, ex its existence. So even the wealthy have to follow the rules. Now, typically they do, typically that the rules serve them better, but if they break the rules, they will still be punished. So as in the case of um, the, uh, the little um, image here I have, which um, represents Enron. So this is when uh, Enron was going down and, um, Here's Ken Lay, um, and you can't really see, but it says Kenny Boy on his little uh, his little raft that he's on. But that's Ken Lay, who was the CEO of Enron, and so um, and he was certainly held accountable for um, his actions, despite the fact that he was a very wealthy man and he was the CEO of Enron. Uh, so because they, but because Enron threatened the capitalist system because they weren't playing by the rules, then they had to be punished. So structural Marxists would use something like the Enron case as an example to show that no, the law law does control the powerful as well. So those are two kind of ways of using Marxist thought um, to, when talking about crime control. So causes of crime then, um, sort of taking a Marxist or conflict perspective, one major cause of crime is what's called surplus value. And surplus value basically, um, this is a key crime producing element uh, of modern corporate capitalism. The more money that corporations make, the more that they can improve to continue to make more money. And so that surplus value is that sort of excess money that's and wealth that's earned that isn't needed to continue the regular production. So there's this constant need, this drive to increase surplus value, which is basically profit is what it is. And so there's a constant drive to increase that, but that economic growth doesn't benefit everybody. It doesn't benefit um, the, the underclass because as surplus value increases, more people are actually displaced or marginalized. They lose their jobs if it's replaced with machinery, um, or they're forced to work for lower wages or become more and more efficient without getting anything else. So um, it's kind of like the opposite of Robin Hood, where um, you steal from the poor to give to the rich. Uh, and so you, the poor become poorer, the rich become richer, and that, that gap between the upper class and the lower class gets increased and increased and increased. Uh, and so then what happens is you have this marginalization process where more people are forced to live in high crime areas, it, and so then they are more at risk of committing crime themselves, but also being victims of crime. Um, it weakens societal bonds because they no longer have that drive to, you know, help the community because the community keeps screwing them over. So, and they also, if they've lost their job or they've been demoted, then they have less ties to conventional values. So that it's going to weaken those societal bonds and make them more likely to commit crimes. So surplus value is one underlying cause that can increase crime from a Marxist perspective. Another one is globalization. And so globalization is, in general, we're talking about creating these transnational markets, um, transnational politics, transnational legal system, this basically overall global economy. And while that's great for a lot of things um, in terms of like innovation and, you know, um, working on our, our relations at the international level and things like that, that's wonderful. But 
it specifically is not beneficial for third world nations. So kind of at the global level, we can look country by country and sort of we have our upper class countries and our lower class countries. And so, and it kind of, it's like the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, but on a national scale. And so when we look at third world nations, then they become the exploited at the global level. And so you have these multinational corporations and they go into uh, third world nations, they exploit the natural resources, take what they want and basically leave. They can avoid regulations because they are no longer held to the regulations of their company, whether it's American or Canadian and, or whatever um, first world country. They're not, they're not held to those regulations anymore and so they can do what they want because they're in another country. So they avoid regulations, which means they can um, pay very little to the workers. They can av avoid like health and safety regulations. They can avoid environmental regulations. It's, it's, while it's getting better, the UN has stepped in to sort of deal with some of these things. It's still, they are not, they are not held to the same standards as if they were doing the same work on Amer American so soil. So, and another big thing is that not only are they paying um, very, very low wages, but they take advantage of these desperate workers and they put them in unsafe situations and they pay them very little and they know that they're still going to work for them because they need the money so much. And so it's, it's exploitation at its finest. And not only does that happen, but also um, expanding the reach of all these, you know, um, beneficial pro-social organizations. Globalization also expands the reach of criminal organizations. So you have criminal businesses can now take advantage of the global market, just like legal corporations can. They can use technology to um, produce, they can use technology to market, they can use technology to distribute. They can also use technology to recruit new members and communicate with their members quickly and easily. So just like any big company, criminal corporations and criminal organizations can use that globalization for their benefit as well. Then we can sort of um, look at state or what's called organized crime or state organized crime. And so the purpose then, um, state crime is a way for the government to maintain their power and for those who support them to maintain their advantages that they get, like being the, the advantages that are associated predominantly with race, class, and gender. And so the state crime then helps to maintain that power and keep those advantages that they get. So one major type of state organized crime is illegal domestic surveillance. And this is things like um, tapping phones, intercepting emails, monitoring communications, all in an effort to stifle dissent and to keep watch over political opponents. And so um, things like CCTVs are becoming more common in large cities. They're supposed to be used to deter and solve crime, but critical theorists would suggest that they're also used to record, record and store information about people without their knowledge. Um, so it depends on what side of that coin you take. But um, in general, then, if you have this domestic surveillance that's happening, then, um, and I mean, it certainly happens in um, other countries, um, but it does happen on American soil as well. We just don't know about it quite as much. Um, so this, this does happen um, at the domestic level. Um, there's also human rights violations that, um, these are things like denial of basic civil rights. So like the right to a trial, um, the disappearance and summary executions of um, political dissidents, which has certainly occurred in Sri Lanka and Iran. Um, the CIA has made use of secret prisons abroad, which they then use to uh, torture and interrogate terrorist suspects without the legal rights that the U.S. provides if they had been doing it on American soil. So um, there are certainly human rights violations happening. There's also what's called state or corporate crime. State corporate crime is where um, you have the abuse of the state authority or a failure to act when they should. So, for example, things like environmental agencies failing to enforce the laws that they know that they're supposed to be enforcing. So that's kind of another type, another way that the state can, can be committing crimes. Uh, and then you have straight up state violence. And this is just like things like intimidation techniques, like the threats um, of violence and the actual violence uh, in, order to in order to deter political dissent. Um, also includes like death squads, like um, those in Russia that were sent against the rebels of Chechnya and their supporters. So they would kidnap and torture and kill many, many people. Um, and so for example, um, you can't really see the uh, the subtext here, but this is this um, photo here is two Chechen men um, getting dragged behind a personnel carrier and they were dragged to death. 
Uh, and so they were dragged through the streets as a show of force, as a show of here's what happens if you go against our government. Uh, so there are various different levels, and I mean it obviously looks different from one country to another, but um, these are all sort of from a Marxist or conflict perspective, these are the powerful maintaining their power by any means necessary. And social institutions um, are also sort of related to um, crime and criminality in the sense that since social institutions can be used as instruments of class oppression and instruments of racial oppression. So um, this would be things like schools, police, courts, these are all instruments of class and racial oppression. So you look at um, education, there are race-based differences in education. Uh, urban minority school systems are more likely to use punitive measures uh, in response to misbehavior by their students, uh, as opposed to the more of the restorative measures, which are more often used in suburban, mostly white schools. Um, also, the dropout rates are much higher in lower class inner city schools. So there is evidence of race based differences in education. We also look at the racial and economic bias um, in the prosecution and punishment of offenders, where you have minority, urban, lower class offenders are more likely to be prosecuted, more harshly punished, especially if it's an interracial crime um, or sort of where whites could just as easily have been the victim, such as theft and burglary and things like that. Because if it's, oh, if, if whites are the victims or they could have been the victims, then that's taken more seriously. So social institutions then in general are designed to favor the rich and the powerful and oppress those without economic power and without any social standing. And so the institutions themselves that are government funded and that are that are based on government guidelines and things like this, they're designed as a way to favor the people that have the money and the power already. And again, to help them maintain that um, in the face of any potential uprising or um, anybody who might threaten those um, those positions of power.